<laughs> so for anyone who's not familiar with the concept of family meal, who might just think it's a new special at McDonald's, can you tell us what the definition is? Well, the, uh, the term is used in restaurants. We don't, we don't call it staff meal, actually. Uh, I, I can't tell you where it started or how it started, but it's always referred to as family meal. Like the chef may ask the cook who's responsible, uh, okay, who's cooking family today? What do, you, what do you got for family today? And um, of course, it goes deeper than that because we, we think of it as a family. And the very act of, of cooking this food and having everyone sit down together and, and enjoy the food does create a sense of family, much as, which is why it has, the book has a wonderful synergy with home cooking because that's what you do it in your own home. And do you feel that the restaurant always has this notion of family? Are there ever incidents in which that's not the case? I know in the book there's a famous cauliflower anecdote oh, when you're stodgy. That was not our restaurant. It was <laughs> in, uh, in Paris yeah, where a um, sous chef, we were sitting at the table eating, and um, the sous chef put a bite of cauliflower into his mouth and spit it out, and we immediately, things got very quiet, and he asked who had cooked that food. And uh, a young apprentice from down the other end of the table raised his hand, and the sous chef motioned him to come up. And when he got there, he punched him. He just <laughs> it's a little bit shocking. Yeah, they didn't have HR departments, and that, that does. I'd days. assume not. And uh, but lesson learned, you know. <laughs> and so, would you say that's the craziest thing that you've seen at Family Meal? Maybe, <laughs> in a, in a negative way, you know. Uh, there's many wonderful things happen in terms of the food that's created and. I've, sometimes family meal is used. Uh, there are special moments when someone may be having a birthday or someone may be leaving, or just as we saw the other day at the Union Square Cafe, a celebration of someone, in this case, who had uh, completed 25 years at the restaurant. As the bartender. As the bartender. Wow. So, um, those are those are occasions, just as in a family, where you want to do something a little special and celebrate that. But so, I also think that just as in a family, it's not always smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. There are arguments. Sometimes they are debates. Um, sometimes they're disagreements. But just because you're having those kind of uh, disagreements or arguments, bringing them to a table together actually, I, I think, heightens the, the possibility that something good might come of it. And I'm very, very impressed. We just got a tour of, of your family table upstairs. Um, the difference is yours is uh, so large that not everyone is eating together at the exact same time. But nonetheless, you're, you're taking time from your day to sit down and be together. And I think especially in a world that you are doing more than anyone to help to create where people spend time um, you know, with a device rather than face to face with somebody else, the table uh, over which conversation can be had with food and drink is one of the last places in our lives that, that really bring human beings together, and we think they crave it even more. Right. I guess eating is and hopefully will remain something you can't do virtually. You have to actually, <laughs> you have to actually sit down. Although, you know what? Food um, one thing I want to make sure you guys do not invent at Google is, is the notion that one of these 3D printers can make a steak medium rare and juicy. <laughs> As long as you don't do that, we're in good shape. OK, fair enough. I'll talk to, talk to the people upstairs okay. about that. And so I know that sometimes becoming a family at a restaurant is quite literal. Danny, I know you met your wife at a restaurant. She was actually the waitress there. So is that what we're all doing wrong? Do we need to start working in front of house to find love? Well, How my, common my, is that? My bet is it's happening right under your nose here. You just don't know about it. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll never forget when Union Square Cafe first opened in 1985, uh, a long time ago. I, I couldn't find the chef one night, and I looked high and low. It wasn't, it was before Michael was there. Michael was cooking at a French restaurant at the time. I looked in the kitchen, he wasn't there. Looked at the dishwasher station, he wasn't there. Looked everywhere, and finally there was only one door I hadn't opened, and that was the walk-in refrigerator in the basement. Uh -oh. And there he was making out with the sous chef in front of the oyster bin. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh boy, this is gonna be interesting. Um, and I called my dad and I said, what do I do? I'd, I'd never run a business before. And he said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, restaurants are a lot like families. And he said, uh, or they're, like, they're like extended families. And the number of intense hours people are working together, they're either going to fight or they're going to fall in love. And as far as I'm concerned, you got the better option of the two here. <laughs> 
So we've had so many people fall in love, have babies. We could do a whole family tree of all of our restaurants. We could probably start three new restaurants just with the offspring of people. I was about to say second generation. You've got to bring them in, train Absolutely. them young. And that, that didn't happen at the French restaurant I was working at because there were no women working there. <laughs> That's a good point. It used to be thought well, that... Uh, I don't know if it was a good point. But <laughs> it was a bad point, but you yeah. make a good point. <laughs> you see, it's like a family. We... Yeah. But that was one of the great things about coming to Union Square Cafe from that French restaurant. It was a whole new world opening up, and there were men and women working in the restaurant, and it was a whole different atmosphere, a whole way of approaching uh, the business um, in a much more open, em, em, you know, embracing people, uh, accepting people. It was more challenging in a way because it was about really dealing with people as individuals and their needs. And it, it was, as you say, hospitality, engaging with the person in a dialogue as opposed to, I'm the chef, do it my way and just shut up, <laughs> which is the old school um, way of approaching it. Well, and clearly you two talk as if you're family, and I know that you've known each other for 30 years. So how did you first meet? The same place he met his wife. <laughs> <laughs> clearly a great restaurant for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a seafood restaurant on 22nd Street that uh, was called Pesca. I think it was actually a little bit ahead of its time. It was San Francisco, a little bit Italian. Um, it was a really good restaurant. And uh, they ended up going out of business at a certain point. It then became Bolo. Mm -hmm. under Bobby Flay, and now it's a rec ball site. There's nothing there. It's kind of sad. But, um, yeah, that was my first restaurant job. And I'll never forget, there came a day when, in addition to Pesca's chef, a guy named Skip, there was this new guy who had just been brought in from France, and none of us knew why he was there. but <laughs> Including um, me. <laughs> <laughs> but but he was clearly cut from a different cloth. He He was, you know all buttoned up, whereas everybody else was kind of slouching. And um, he wore one of these fancy white kerchiefs. He looked like a, a Boy Scout almost with his little <laughs> white kerchief. And then he would leave the restaurant wearing Armani suits, which we didn't even know what that was in 1984. And um, actually, I was so impressed with, with Michael's work that I begged the owner of the restaurant to let me move to the kitchen, because I had been the lunch maitre d' or the lunch assistant manager and uh, and we got to know each other I got to I don't think they gave me very many jobs I got to snip the faces off of soft shell crabs and uh, all the glamorous work clearly saute uh, a couple things finally you graduated me to the risotto station <laughs> the risotto al mare I remember that but anyway then he was gone all of a sudden he was just gone and I had no idea where he went where'd you go La Caravel. Oh, La Caravel, that's right. So but we stayed in touch. Yeah. Michael became a famous, uh, sh famous because not only was he a really good chef, but he was the first young American chef ever hired at one of the fancy midtown French restaurants. And back then, all the good restaurants or all the restaurants that were taken seriously in New York, this is going to sound crazy to you guys, but they were all in midtown and they all started with Le La or eel, every every single one, because we didn't trust that that Americans really knew how to cook that well. I know you mentioned him wearing suits. Is that a tradition that you still continue? Because you used to say early on in your career, I, I loosened up a bit. No, it, because because coming from the what did uh, you used to say? What did he used that, to say? That every day you would come in wearing yeah, a yeah, suit. Yeah, definitely. Well, because at kitchen. La Caravelle, again, the Midtown French, that was how. The, it was sort of the dress code of the restaurant. That's how our guests dressed. And um, it, it was appropriate, and the owners felt it was appropriate to dress the same way. And um, yeah, it, it used to get a little crazy because I would you know, go in for the morning service, change into my whites, and then after the morning service, change in, back into the suit, go out and maybe go to the gym or do something and come back, change again, and then leave and change again. <laughs> it was a lot of changing. <laughs> and you don't see many chefs in suits, I feel, these days. So. Well, the times have changed. <laughs> right. So can you remember the first family meal that you guys shared together? I, I, I think it was at Pesca. And uh, I was just telling somebody the story the other day. But uh, that was a really hard time because that was when we were first learning about AIDS. This was in 1984. We had never heard about this illness before. And uh, one of the 
servers at the restaurant um, had been sick with something mysterious. He was losing weight like crazy. He was breaking out in a way no one had ever seen. And he would come back and work for a while, and then he would leave. No one had any idea what it was. But it was at family meal where we learned about it. Uh, it was uh, it was hard because one of the things that does happen at family meal is that the um, chef or the sous chef prepares the specials for that day, and the whole staff tastes them so that when you come to the restaurant, you say, "So, what do you recommend?" The you know the waiter can have a uh, an informed answer, and that was the meal where we were told that. Uh, that that was going to stop happening. There was no more sharing. Back then, we would all take the exact same fork and just pass it around. And uh, that was one of the family meals I remember most. The other one I remember most was um, the first time that I had ever had a job where we were allowed to drink wine before going to work. And um, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I think we'd all agree. And, and we would do wine tastings together. Um, and that became a hallmark of how we did our training at Union Square Cafe. But that's... That's something that I think we both learned uh, at various times. I only cooked in France for about three months. Michael cooked there for about three years in Switzerland. Six years, yeah. Six years. But there was never a family meal in France where the staff didn't sit down together and not only have their food before you would come into the restaurant, but we'd actually have a glass of wine together. And everybody trusted it. Nobody was um, you know, abusing the system. It was good. I, I remember one place I worked in France where there was a young chef, very, very talented, but uh, a little impetuous and headstrong. And he would come in the morning. I'd be in the, having a chamomile tea in the, mor in the morning, this is. And he'd come over to my station and dump out the tea and pour in white wine in the cup. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> get to work. It's like, OK. <laughs> so over the course of the past 30 years, what would you both say are some of the best and worst parts about working with each other? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you could just say positive things. That, that wasn't act, part act of our contract that we had to talk about question. that. Family uh, question. I'm would. i going to go with the best. He can talk about the worst. Should, um, I, should I leave? <laughs> no, the, the best part, I, I think, were uh, that almost every single year, keep in mind, we had one restaurant, Union Square Cafe, for the first 10 years. So it hasn't really been until the last period of time that we've been expanding. Gramercy Tavern was our second restaurant after 10 years, and then there was 11 Madison Park and Tabla and Blue Smoke and Mylino and Shake Shack and the Modern North End Grill. Catch a breath. Uh, creative Juice, which we're very excited about. I saw them pouring their juice upstairs, so that was that was that was good to see. But anyway, during those first 10 years, same number of hours in the day, but we just spent a whole lot more of them together, and we would go on a lot of culinary expeditions. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be in Italy, it could be France, it could be parts of, of this country. And the, the most fun would be to, um, to just go get ideas. And keep in mind, guys, this was way before Google. And, so if you, and it was way before things like GPS. So if you wanted to go discover a new idea, which you need to do for your, for your restaurants, you would really do the old-fashioned kind of sleuth work, which was meeting the right people, asking the right questions, turning over the right rocks. And you would find your way to some out-of-the-way, you know, bistro in the countryside of France or, you know, trattoria in the countryside of outside of Bologna, let's say. And you would take your Michelin map and do the best you could to find these little roads that barely even existed on the best map in the world. And by doing that work a little harder than anyone else did, we could often discover dishes that no one had seen in New York City. And we could bring them back here together, serve them at Union Square Cafe, and we would have a two-year runway before, and people would love it, before anyone would copy it. Mm. Uh, today, it's so hard because by the time we find a place, it's already been photographed, um, yeah. you know, Remember panna cotta in Piedmont? Of course I do. No, I mean, <laughs> that fits the description of what you're saying. Yeah, I remember the restaurant where we yeah. had it in La Morra. It was, yeah, mind-boggling, just this incredible. I mean, panna cotta, it's, you know, it's become the quiche of uh, our And I, do you remember the uh, polo al lambrusco mm. with the frittata with the balsamico? Mm. and I getting you hungry. Guys lunch so already. <laughs> that's, that's, those were the best times. And, and for me, the best day ever was... Um, 
We were going to try to do a French version of Union Square Cafe. That's kind of how 11 Madison Park started off. It was going to be a bistro brasserie, but not too fancy. That was how 11 Madison got its start. And so we went to Paris, and uh, the very first day, right off the airplane, we ate six Michelin stars, <laughs> two three-star restaurants in a row. And the, my favorite part was you were knocked out by the time we got to dessert. Wow. <laughs> and we had five bistros to hit the next day. Dude, jet lag and foie gras together. It's just, as long as you, your head didn't land up in the plate. Deadly, I think that's deadly fine. combination. Yeah. And then, so what about your parents? Did they, were they encouraging of this career choice? Obviously, it's worked out for you both, but. No, my parents were not thrilled when I told them I was quitting. I was, had gotten through two years of regular college at Fordham. And, um. Uh, I was working at a restaurant, Serendipity, on the on the uh, east side there, which is still there. Yes, it's amazing. And the owners of the restaurant introduced me to James Beard, who gave me that little bit of encouragement to uh, pursue this. He said, "If you really like cooking, why don't you do it as a career? Go to school, and learn how to do it." So I went. I quit college and enrolled in a uh, in the City University had a um, has still a hotel and restaurant program. My parents were not thrilled to hear that I was quitting college because it was their dream to have their children, my sister and myself, go to college. And um, But it was the right thing. It really was the right thing. Once I got into that school and um, started learning about cooking in a professional way and, and running a restaurant, I was so happy. I, it felt like this is what I really want to do. And I did very well at it because I could really apply myself. And um, school had become such a drag. Um, I was really not enjoying it. But this was wonderful. Danny, what about you? Well, I don't think anyone in my particular generation who had gotten a liberal arts degree was even remotely thinking about going into the restaurant business. It was, you know, it was just way before food TV and, you know, where. Dining out has really become a spectator sport, and it's something that I think we've gotten really lucky. I think we were born at the right time. It, it's something that people reserved really good food for anniversaries and birthdays, and on the other occasions they went to a bar or a pub or you know just the local, the local restaurant. But it wasn't something that people pursued and, and followed and took pictures of and you know mm. forget tweeting and open table and all that kind of stuff. It just didn't exist. So it was completely not something that, that I thought I was going to do, but I just feel so lucky uh, to have done it. I had been thinking about becoming a lawyer, and it was on the eve of taking my LSATs that I freaked out um, over dinner. I was with my aunt and uncle and a grandmother, and um, I couldn't drink wine. I couldn't eat a lot of food because I was so nervous about the next morning. And my uncle uh, basically... So it was. It actually was someone in my family that caused this to happen, and and when he asked me what was bothering me, I said, "Because I'm taking my LSATs." And he said, "Well, you do want to be a lawyer, don't you?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and and he said he basically dropped his fork and he said, "You know, you're going to be dead forever. Why in the world would you do something that you don't love during these few moments that you're alive?" And I said, "Because I don't know what else to do with my political science degree," and. <laughs> And he said, that's the stupidest answer I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I said, well, what should I do? And he said, are you kidding? I mean, all I've ever heard you talk about is restaurants and food. And I said, should I go eat in restaurants the rest of my life? <laughs> it just did, it still didn't dawn on me that this was a viable kind of career path. Mm. And, and he said, he said, he, he gave me a hard time. He said, I'm not talking to you again until you answer the question the right way. And literally, it was. I took the LSATs that Saturday morning, never applied, and it was the Monday thereafter that I called one of my buddies from college and said, let's, let's go to restaurant school together. And he made the mistake of telling his dad, who said, over my dead body, um, and his dad sent him to business school. Um, we're still good friends, but he got out. But he did introduce me. He was in a bank training program, and he introduced me to the, back then, banks would never lend money to restaurants. But their bank, U.S. Trust, had exactly one restaurant client, Pesca. Mm. And my friend said, the least I can do is to introduce you to our one restaurant client. They're really nice people, and I can get you an interview there. 
And I, I got the interview, which consisted of being looked up and down, and the owner said, you'll do. That was, again, before HR departments. And if it had not been for taking the LSATs, the next day calling the guy I called and him feeling bad but hooking me up with that one restaurant, I never would be in this industry. I never would have met him. I never would have met my wife. Um, so just for me, it's a great lesson that uh, it's every day we get presented with these incredible options that you didn't even know were going to present themselves to you. And if you just go in each case, if you really go with your gut and your passion, it's just remarkable as you look back over time um, how your life can change. Absolutely. Well, I think we're all glad that it worked out. Um, I, want to, I want to go back a second. Yes. I never got to answer that. Yeah, Michael's oh, yes, not glad course. it worked out. So he's going to yes. tell you what he hates about it. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Like, like you, I will say what was great about it. And but. It, no, it was, it was <laughs> coming to Union Square Cafe. So I had already had, I don't know how many years of experience in the business. And, uh, you know, talked with Danny and persuaded me to come to this downtown place that was not what I thought was my career path, which was the classic French. But once there, um, I think the best, the best thing was watching Danny, who was very inexperienced at this thing, but really passionate about it. It was very. And uh, um, l learning and creating and growing and what we have now, our, our restaurant group, and the, the, not only the, the physical places, but the ideas, the philosophy, that are very important and, and I think really beautiful. Watching that spark uh, uh, ignite in you and develop uh, was really, really the best. I mean, the trips were wonderful and all that, but this whole uh, idea of watching this just blossom uh, was an amazing process, it's, and it's still going on. And that's a philosophy we call enlightened hospitality, which I, I know is pretty, what we call it is just what we call it, but it, I think it's how you guys run your company, which is basically saying no business in the world uh, is different in terms of the stakeholders. We all have the exact same five stakeholders, but in what order are you going to prioritize them? And I think family meal is actually a great expression of saying it, it, if you really want the best outcome, you got to start with yourself. You got to take care of your own team first, even before you put your your guests second. And the notion of putting your customers second uh, was certainly not anything we were taught about. And the notion of putting your investors fifth after your employees, after your customers, after your community, after your suppliers, and really believing that by virtue of doing it that way, you create a virtuous cycle, and you can make more money if you put your investors fifth. And you can make more customers happy if you put your customers second, is what we've developed over time. Now, just quickly, I thought Michael was going to say the worst thing, which was that in the um, it took me eight months, even though we knew each other, to convince him to leave this fancy schmancy French restaurant on 55th Street. It was a great restaurant. I don't blame him for not wanting to leave. But come on, Union Square Cafe didn't have a le or an L in front of it. And. Uh, Fine. Yeah, I was, I was even willing to call it Eel Union Square Cafe, if, was, <laughs> if that would help. I was even going to change the name. Um, but anyway, I, finally, after about month six, I convinced him to at least come downtown and experience the restaurant, just as a guest. Okay, take, don't take my word for it, Michael. Just see it. And so he brings in three people. They're a table for four, you know. And uh, do you remember what happened there yeah. on that night? And, of course, I'm very nervous because... My whole future is hinging upon this one meal here. And Danny was very generous and brought over four complimentary glasses of champagne on a tray. He himself was in the dining room uh, carrying the tray with the four glasses of champagne, which he proceeded to drop on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> and not only did the champagne spill, but, but one of the glasses shattered all over Michael's lap. So obviously, uh, he has a very good sense of humor. and. Uh, <laughs> It was a memorable start. It was a good start. It's a, a good omen. So 30 years now, third cookbook. Whose idea was it to create the family table? Uh, 27 and a half years. Oh. Just want to, don't push us. Nearly yeah. 30 yeah. years. Um, well, uh, uh, the co-author, Karen Stabiner, who, uh, whose daughter works in our company, 
and is a regular, fairly, was a fairly regular diner at our, our company, um, observed that the fact, something we knew very well, that every day, twice a day, our entire staff sits down to meals that are prepared by the cooks, for the cooks, and the dining room. And she had a conversation with us, and we thought there could be something wonderful in this, in, in presenting not only uh, the, the food, the recipes of what's being prepared, but also the stories to celebrate the people who animate our restaurants, who are the, the lifeblood of our restaurants. Because there's so many wonderful stories about, the, some of them have been there 25 years, and um, they, in that time, people assume certain roles, some iconic roles that become very important to the, just like in a family, to the, the smooth running of the operation. And they're the people who bring in the new people and show them what to do and what not to do. And it's important that they're like the anchors that hold the, the history of the place together. So uh, as we got into the work a little bit more, it, it became very, very interesting because one of, one of the big challenges for me, unlike my, the first two books we did, those were my recipes. Those were recipes we were serving in the Union Square Cafe. They were tried and true. It was just a matter of selecting them and then getting them to the home size. These were not my recipes. These are recipes that the cooks are making for themselves. And in fact, there was no recipe. They were just throwing stuff together. They would just go raid the refrigerator right. for the items that, you know, when you're cooking, there's always stuff that you butchered on the side or, you know, the leaves of something where you use the right. heart of the, the fruit or the vegetable. And uh, they come up with dishes. These guys are amazing. They, they have lots and lots of really good ingredients to cook with. They have a, only a little bit of time to do it because they're spending so much time preparing for when you come in. Um, and they've got to come up with something that's economical, quick, and can be done in large portions. And what they delicious. tend to do, and delicious, because they're cooking for each other and they're going to get immediate feedback. <laughs> And they want to take care of each other. And uh, what what's amazing about it is they also draw, unlike in the restaurant where we're trying to create food that's going to feel like this is something I never could have done at home. That's why I like going there. You don't just go there because we're going to do your dishes. You want <laughs> These cooks are cooking things from their home. And so through this book, you're going to find all kinds of ethnic touches because if you give some really good beef to this guy, and he's from the Dominican Republic, this is what you're going to get. If you give that same beef to somebody from Texas, you're going to get something completely different. Or Korea. Or Korea, or Ecuador, um, or Colombia. And so what, what's fun about this book is that the only through line is uh, this is food from the heart, mm. from people who go to work for the purpose of taking care of people. When I thought what what was really interesting about the book is it's not just the high profile chefs who are part of Union Square Hospitality Group that you hear about so often. It's a lot of behind the scenes stories. It's a lot of people you might never see front of house. So how intentional was that decision to kind of highlight them in the Absolutely, photographs and yeah. the stories? Completely intentional. We did ask the chefs, again, who do not cook the family meal, to contribute recipes that they might cook for their families or have cooked for them. And that's how my, the best recipe in the book is my mother's lasagna. And that's how that got in there. According to you, it's According the best to me. Recipe. <laughs> I kind of I like our family's roast asparagus with, uh, anyway, but. Okay. You get the book, you can check both out and then inform right. us who the winner is. Or serve one with the other. But um, yeah, it's definitely about the, the, the cooks making this, not about the, the uh, high profile chefs. Mm -hmm. And so do dishes from Family Meal ever make it to the restaurant? I know I've heard a lot about the Dominican beef. Yeah, that has. It's a dish that uh, Victor has been making for a long time, as long as I can remember. And I vote, every time he makes it, I'm so delighted. And now the current chef, Carmen Quagliata, who's the brilliant chef at Union Square Cafe, is, uh, put, he put it on the brunch menu. We've had that happen at Maialino, um, our our breakfast cook, um, or he was our breakfast cook, now he's at Gramercy Terrace, who we lovingly call Hoss. Uh, he's from New Orleans originally, or somewhere in Louisiana. And he would make these uh, ham-studded biscuits, which don't exactly go with uh, a Roman trattoria. And he would, but that's fine, because for family meals, same thing. That's where I'm from. I've got some ends of the prosciutto that, that we couldn't slice when you guys come in. 
and they were awesome. And he would pour maple syrup all over them. And we sell those now. We make a lot of money. <laughs> so how would you say from a technological standpoint, advances have changed the way that you approach making cookbooks from your first till now? Hmm. Be it photography or? You know, that's, that's such a good question. At the end of the day, I think what a, a cookbook author has to make a huge number, the first decision you have to make, irrespective of technology or, or photography, is this. What's the point of this cookbook? Is this a marketing tool slash souvenir for the restaurant that, that, while beautiful, will never be cooked from? In other words, is this a book that we hope might live on your living room coffee table? Or do we hope this is a book that you'll actually get olive oil all over the pages and rip out the pages because you, you can't stop using it? And I would say that more often than not, we have sided on the, we want people to use it. Um, our books are, I hope you'll find that it's not unattractive, but my bet is that this is not going to be stacked up with, you know, the French Laundry and Eleven Madison Park, which are gorgeous, gorgeous cookbooks. Um, I think this is one that you're going to cook from. And so I think that um, the technology, to a degree that that's important, um, is that you can... I, I think the only thing that I think about technology-wise is that everything's done on ebooks, but I'm still not sure that that works as well for a cookbook. Not but in the making of the book, other than obviously the advances in photography, uh, digital photography, but other than that, it feels pretty much about the same. I mean, doing this book and the first book, which came out in 94, I don't know that there was much difference. And at the end of the day, what matters more than anything is did you test the recipes? Right. Because... And that's the same. Yeah. Um, as I said, we don't think we have the capability of producing a gorgeous book. So since, since we know that's not our greatest strength, what we do rely on is what we think our greater strength is, is we want, if you cook, we want you to feel like a winner. If you're going to go to the trouble of buying the ingredients and you know prepping them in your own kitchen, uh, we want you to say, that was a really good use of my time. And the way that's going to happen is that both you and the people you're cooking for say, that was yummy. Where'd you get that recipe? Yeah. And that's what we want to have happen. We actually delayed this book for six months because we were not as thrilled as we wanted to be with these dishes tasting exactly like they tasted uh, when they were cooked for family right. meal. Because it was a question of they really developing the recipe. Tested and tested and retested. And, and you have to be careful with using too much high-tech equipment in, in testing, in, as a matter of fact, we want to test not on our professional ranges and things, but on something akin to what most folks have at home, because otherwise the, it, could, it could change the recipe. And our recipe tester shops for the ingredients in regular markets. We don't just take them from our restaurants, because again, if it can't be done with the market that you go to, whether it's a green market or a supermarket, right. then it may not taste right. Then the other thing that we really try to encourage people is it's like a piece of music. This is how the music was written. Try to play it and then make it yours thereafter. So Michael doesn't actually stop in your home and you know check to see if you're doing it right. We could arrange that. I mean, yeah, we wish. I think there'd be a long line for that <laughs> sign up. Um, well, so we're about to take some audience questions. There are two microphones if you guys want to line up. Um, and before we do, just to give you a chance to, to ask them, we have a couple fill in the blanks. So <laughs> the most challenging part of my job is? I have not yet succeeded at adding more than 24 hours to a day. <laughs> when you do, let us all know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess coming up with new ideas, keeping things fresh, keeping things uh, with the times. And if I weren't in this industry, I would be? A cookbook author. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe in the music business. I hate it when I get asked. Hopefully it's nothing I asked, but. <laughs> <laughs> what if it is? Um, that, that's fine. I can, your, I can take it. What's your favorite restaurant in New York? Why did you go into this business? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I, I wish I really knew. I, I wish I knew. I think the answer, and 
it actually gives me another chance to answer the question because it's not my story. It's, it's, it's the fact that we all have something inside of us that if we just listen to it, there it is. And, mm. and the reason that I don't like the question is that I always end up answering it based on my story when it's really just everybody's story, which is just listen to what's telling you is there. In my fridge, I always have... Japanese condiments. <laughs> <laughs> Mayonnaise. My hangover cure is... Another drink. <laughs> Not getting out of bed. <laughs> the secret to shack sauce is... <laughs> Until... Really remain a secret. <laughs> thought I, I thought I'd get you guys with that one. At least you tried. Lastly, my greatest food indulgence is... Actually, the secret is it tastes good. <laughs> um, sausage and mushroom pizza from almost anywhere. I have my favorites, but you tell me we're going to have sausage and mushroom pizza, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> okay, so I think we've got our first question. So I, I like cooking, but it's hard to compete with the chefs at Google. So I cook on weekends and I have friends over. But my trouble that I have with following recipes is that they say, you know, buy a bunch of stuff that some of which I have, some of which I don't, and then I'm not going to cook until the next week. So what I really like to do is be able to say, I have this stuff that's sitting around the kitchen. What can I make with it? And I'm wondering if you have given thoughts to addressing for this ingredient here are things that you could do with it rather than saying, make this dish. Hmm idea for another book. <laughs> no, I, uh, Michael just said that's a great idea for another book. Um, I, I do think, though, that given what you're concerned about, that this book here um, is, it's actually exactly what our cooks are faced with is the exact same thing you're faced with. They don't get to go out shopping uh, in order, they don't get to call the purveyor and order stuff for family meal. They're looking in the refrigerator, they're looking in the cupboard, and they're saying, how can I do a balanced meal, something green, something starchy, something protein, something, whatever it happens to be, because we really cover the whole gamut, uh, not to the degree you guys do upstairs, perhaps, but um, it's based on what we have you know, on hand. So what I would say, you can reverse engineer this cookbook. You can probably reverse engineer a lot of cookbooks and look at what you have in your refrigerator and then look in the ingredients, uh, look in the index of the, of the cookbook. I'm pretty sure you're not going to find too many wacky things. What I would get frustrated about is a recipe that forces me to go buy something and I use a tiny bit and the rest either sits on the inside of my refrigerator door shelving or in the cabinet for the next three years till it gets green on the edges or something. And also, you can, um, as, you, as you reverse engineer the recipe, if you have uh, ingredients um, that you have left over, uh, if you look at another recipe that attracts your attention, and it might not have that ingredient, but a, an ingredient that is similar in texture or form and cooking time. I'll give an example of if you've used celery and you've got celery left over, and there's something uh, that calls for fennel. Um, use the celery, you know what I mean? Substitute, play around with it, and um, you can use up what, what you have. It's a good practice to go yeah, through so and use up what you have. Learning to liberate yourself also. Um, if a recipe calls for kale uh, and all you have is spinach. Or chard or something. Yeah, like but just use your head and say, all right, it's, it's not the end of the world if I put in spinach, but spinach is a lot more tender than kale. So if there's a cooking element to it, you're not going to cook it as much. But... It's, uh, it's, not, it's not rocket science, this stuff. <laughs> it, seriously, it's just look at this as a starting point of flavors that go together that make people happy mm. as opposed to a science experiment that if you don't get it perfectly, it's going to lead to unhappiness. Right. So my question is along those lines and along the, one of the last ones you were at, was asked. So I have a stack of cooking books and... I now have a new baby, and I do cook almost every night. Um, I find myself more and more using a tablet and searching on the internet and, and, and putting things together based on that, because going to the cookbook is just hard. And um, 
what would you, how I don't I don't think I'm alone there. So the question is, what would the cookbook of the future look like? And along the lines of this question is, and what you suggested is, could you make it more dynamic in the sense that you could have a recipe that kind of evolves with based on what you have and the time you have and so on? Hmm. Yeah, it might be a way to plug in the ingredients you have and then have that generate a recipe or lead you to a, a recipe, either right. an existing one. Yeah, that, that would and be how do you cool. pay for that? Because, right, there is intellectual, uh, intellectual property there. Right now, the people post, uh, post um, recipes on the internet, and you know, I, I have to, you have to validate them as, as opposed to having some validation that it came from some authority and so on. Hmm. Well, we don't, I mean, when the book goes out, it's, it's uh, open for the public to use, and including other restaurants. So. But that's, a, um, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, you asked, what does a cookbook of the future look like? I've heard for years, uh, I haven't seen it yet, but in the same way that uh, it's really hard to find a kitchen that doesn't have a microwave oven, um, your kitchen doesn't have one, does it? It does. All right, even his kitchen has a microwave oven. That uh, people have said that the tablets will become ubiquitous, you know, with you know, sort of temperature-proof fronts, and that it'll actually be on your kitchen wall for the purpose of being able to um, to look up recipes. And there's so many recipes online right now. In fact, there are there are websites I forget the name of it um, that have gotten hundreds and hundreds of cookbook authors to agree to just give it away because in the hope that if someone likes the one or two recipes that are on the website, that they'll then follow up, I guess kind of like a Pandora version of cookbooks, you know, that they'll then go buy the cookbook thereafter. But we haven't, we haven't done that ourselves. No, but it's an interesting prospect, just plugging in ingredients and having recipes come up. You guys could do that, <laughs> figure out a way to <laughs> make that happen. We have time for two more questions. So one of the things that I, I love and I'm sure many other people love about Shake Shack, particularly the, the park location, is that there's the web camera and you can see the line. And I think that's like, you know, being here that you're at Google, like it's something that I want to, I think is just very forward looking, like when it came out, I don't know how many years ago that functionality came out, but it's just amazing that sort of marriage of technology and just using it in a way that's like not necessarily in your face. Uh, have you? I would just like to hear your thoughts about what you think maybe the next step of how you might integrate technology, maybe, you know, not just at like Shake Shack, but some far in the future restaurant or maybe the next restaurant and, and what you think might be sort of the next game changing implementation of, of maybe something more technological in your restaurants. Knowing that that's not your focus, of course, but, you know, just, just an idea. Um, well, I'm glad you like the Shack Cam. And as recently as uh, last week, we had a discussion as to whether we should do more of them with the different Shake Shacks. And so far, we, we've decided not to just because, I don't know, it just it, we don't want to be in your face. But what I could imagine uh, in our business as being the next frontier for us, I think has to do with how you pay in the restaurants. And I know Starbucks has been uh, has invested in the square which allows you to um, you know to pay without if it's going to work for Starbucks to save time and to capture information you can only imagine how much time you could save instead of expecting and hoping that your server in a restaurant knows exactly when it is that you want to go and exactly when you're done and uh, I think the opportunity for us to custom make more of, of your experience based on what you like uh, exists. And it's somewhere, you know, we've made a lot of headway over the last decade and a half with things like Open Table that allow you to reserve whenever you want to reserve, but it also from our end allows us to capture more information about, you know, how often you come to which of our restaurants, how um, where you like to sit, who your favorite waiter is, um, what your dietary preferences are. What we haven't done a great job of is, is sort of putting that together with, um, with when you, 
give, giving you the power to determine more about what happens inside of your experience itself. We, to a degree, believe that high tech and high touch can help each other, but we're still much more in the high touch camp when it comes to the actual restaurant experience. So if you want to send us any good ideas, you should, you should know that we're, we, we're aware, we know that there's something else there. Um, but getting back to family table, we just don't want to lose the sense that uh, we're, we're happy that you come in with your camera and you, you, know, you Instagram something that you loved. We think that 95% of the pictures being taken are to tell someone else th about something you liked. Um, so we like that technology is entering the experience, but we still kind of hope that, that for that time you're at the restaurant, it's the time that you are still with the person you're with and not only doing this the whole time. So it's a good question. Um, as a team of co-authors, I would be so interested to know what your process was like for writing the book from idea generation to development to getting it all down and any surprises along the way and kind of whether you guys had roles that became more fixed or if they overlapped and kind of how that all worked. Can I just go first and say I'm not the co-author of this book. We have co-authored books together, but uh, Michael's co-author was Karen Stabiner. All I did was write the foreword. So I just... I just want to be really clear that um, if you don't like the recipes, it's not on me. <laughs> and, and, that, and that process was um, pretty clearly delineated. Karen was the one who had the sometimes thankless job of going in and um, uh, ascertaining what, once we had determined what were the recipes uh, uh, we wanted to include, and that was done by watching and participating in the family meals throughout all of our restaurants. Um, then the work had to begin uh, to sort of capture that recipe from the cook. And again, this is not an established recipe that someone is doing. It's whatever is there that day, the inspiration that comes, and little of this, little of that. But that little of this and that had to be turned into, you know, two and a half cups of this and three tablespoons of that. And that's that's difficult because they're not cooking that way. They're just throwing stuff in. So um, Karen did the initial capture of here's this recipe, here's a rough idea of what it's going to look like, at which point, whoops, I took over and um, we had to test it and then make it work as a recipe. And sometimes that involved an executive decision of like, well, I'm not going to put that much of that in there. I'm going to put a little of this in here. And um, But by and large, we, we remained very true to what the initial recipe was. And uh, then there was the part of getting the stories, which was a similar dynamic of talk interviewing and talking to people and um, getting that together and then you know then it goes into the photography which I had to do the worked with the food stylist and get the the, the food to look right and how it took a long time to figure out who would be the right photographer because family meal is not gorgeous food by nature it's right. not Doesn't it just come looking like that like it does in the book well no but the the point is is that if if this if these were gorgeous photographs it would lose a lot of the authenticity that this is what we put out on the fly for each other. No tweezers used to put them. And so we had to, find, we had to find just the right photographer who could catch people being people mm -hmm. and who could catch food being food. Um, and the right stylist who understood that a great stylist wants to be known for being a great stylist. They don't want to be known for just letting food be food. And so it was a, right. that was an interesting experience with this cookbook. Right. All those choices along the way have to have to happen. So. Were there any big surprises in the process? Uh, some, uh, for me, the surprises were around recipes that had difficulty getting to work, just because they were so uh, kind of raw and inaccurate, and and or I had to make a decision that sometimes with the chef's recipes it was a little beyond what I thought should be included in a family. A little, a little too, maybe too precious, or it would have wound up being too expensive. And um, I, I'm very sure that that chef making that dish, it would have turned out amazing. But I wasn't sh so sure that it could have worked in, in the cookbook with the home cook. So I had to edit, I had to veto certain things. And 
make the selection. So those there were some surprises there. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, Michael and Danny, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come visit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.